As a kid, I hated reading. In fact, I don't think I read a full book till I was in high school. I always figured that I would just wait till the movie came out, right? It's called reading. Top to bottom, left to right. Group words together as a sentence. Take Tylenol for any headaches. Might offer any cramps. My entire life changed over the course of a summer. I had an internship as a golf rules official where I was essentially just sitting in a golf cart doing nothing for the entire summer. Looking back, I was lucky because this was right before social media really took off. Should keep people coming back to the site and maybe could make something cool. What is the Facebook exactly? For that entire summer, I literally had nothing better to do than read. I finished five books sitting out there on the golf course, basically doubling my entire life's reading total at the time. Since then, I never looked back. Reading changed from an academic chore into a way for me to learn specific topics that I was most interested in. One area that I was fascinated with was the intersection of my mind and body. I've read hundreds, possibly thousands of books on this topic, since that fateful summer over 10 years ago. These are the seven books that have challenged my conventional thinking and helped me to make some pretty incredible health-related changes over my life. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Everyone gets different things from books, but if you're looking for some motivation, a new perspective, or just to learn something about your body and mind, I hope that at least one of these books really resonates with you. Online, we hear about the keto diet, the Mediterranean diet, going vegetarian, vegan, or even carnivore, but which is the best? Which is the healthiest? What if instead of focusing on what we put into our body, we instead looked at our unique biology to determine what we should eat? The seventh book on my list is The Personal Diet by Aaron Segal and Aaron Elanov. I think I pronounced that right which I did with my colleague Aran Elinav. This one really opened my mind to the complexities of food. In the media, we're constantly focusing on the diets and what everyone should put into our body. It's not that these diets are wrong, but the research in this book found that the effectiveness of these different eating patterns, they varied greatly by the individual. More specifically, they found that individuals have positive or negative reactions to food based on the makeup of their gut microbiome. For those who aren't familiar, the gut microbiome is the various bacteria that live in your gut. Everyone has unique, gut bacteria makeup, very much like we have unique fingerprints. And our unique makeup can directly impact our interactions with food in our stomachs. Obviously, there are some foods that are better for us than others. If I go out and I eat a box of donuts every day, it's probably not gonna be great for me. And if I eat leafy greens or something like that, that's probably good for me. On the other hand, a lot of the foods that we have negative reactions to, they vary tremendously by the individual. For example, maybe I can eat a piece of uh, sourdough bread, a, a nice freshly baked like whole grain sourdough and feel perfectly fine. While my editor Tony could eat the same bread and feel sluggish and tired. <sighs> this would likely happen because his gut produced a strong reaction to the sugar in the bread or something like that. On the other hand, he might be able to eat that same piece of bread with some butter on it and not see the blood sugar spike. There's just so much nuance in how our gut bacteria reacts, it kind of blew my mind. The biggest thing that I took away from this book was that eating and diet should be experimental. There isn't a one size approach that works for everyone. If we wanna eat what's best for our body, we need to try things and we need to measure the results. To the best of my knowledge, there are a few ways to figure out what foods you can have a negative reaction to. First, you can keep a food journal and track how you feel after meals. Second, you can get a blood glucose monitor, which are hopefully becoming more accessible soon, and track your blood sugar after eating certain things. Finally, I'm pretty sure the authors of the book have a machine learning based solution that can predict what foods you're sensitive to based on a sample of your gut bacteria. I'm obviously pretty fascinated with the model that they use, being a data scientist myself. When I think about how much time I spend on my phone each day, it scares me. When I think about how much of that time I spend scrolling, it scares me even more. The next book on my list is called Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. If it wasn't clear before, this book terrified me. The premise of the book is that our technology, mostly our phones, makes it incredibly difficult to be present in our work and in our life. In Newport's other books, Deep Work and So Good They Can't Ignore You, he stresses the importance of a state called Deep Work, or in other words, work without distractions. There's again, a little more nuance to that, but that's the gist. As I've gotten more heavily involved with social media, I found it harder and harder to focus on tasks like coding, learning, and reading. I know that my phone's to blame for most of this. More specifically, my lack of self-control around my phone or other devices. This shouldn't surprise me though. As a data scientist, I know how powerful the algorithms are that govern these devices. They're designed to keep you constantly engaged. They're programmed to give us random dopamine spikes to keep us hooked and addicted. Now, this exploits psychological vulnerabilities in our mind. It makes it almost impossible to not go back and hit that app one more time. To me, this book was a major wake-up call. I needed to control my devices before they took control of me. Since then, I think I've done a decent job of using my socials mostly for posting rather than consuming. Although this has been pretty difficult since I started having an Instagram presence. Uh, you're welcome to follow me there if you'd like.
Something that really struck me from this book is looking at the history of how humans spent their time. Frankly, living in a cave and that lifestyle, probably pretty boring. Historically, we've had a lot of downtime to just think. With our phones now, we're constantly stimulated. We're always doom scrolling. Do we even think anymore or do we just consume? It's hard, but spending time doing nothing or just thinking has tangibly improved my mental clarity and my energy. Don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you're done. Stay hard. That's right. The fifth book on this list is by one of my favorite motivators, David Goggins. This is a bit different from the other books because it's an autobiography of Goggins' life. I can't do the story justice, but essentially Goggins went from being abused as a child and eventually feeling sorry for himself, hundreds of pounds overweight, and, and spraying for bugs as an exterminator, to becoming a Navy SEAL, an ultra marathoner, and some would say the hardest man on the planet. His story is incredible, but it's also inspiring. He overcame true adversity and was able to make something incredible out of his life. And you also have the ability to do that. What I loved about this book wasn't just the story. Each chapter also gives you ways that you can integrate the incredible mindset into your life. You learn about the cookie jar, the accountability mirror, and the 40% rule. Stripping away the story, what this book really taught me about my health was that physically and mentally, I was capable of far more than I thought. The limits on what I could do or I could not do were all self-imposed. It also taught me that doing hard things constantly makes doing everything else a little easier. Goggins believes that the easiest place to build discipline is the body and that permeates the mind over time. I love the idea that I'm training my body and my mind when I exercise. This has transformed how I view fitness. I look at it as a necessity. It's the training that I'm doing to tackle any of the challenges that life throws at me in the future. The average person takes around 22,000 breaths each day. Sometimes we're conscious of them, other times they're automatic. I can't think of any other activity that we do at a higher volume that we at least have some control over. What if for 22,000 times per day, you were breathing wrong? The fourth book on this list is called Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art by James Nestor. The book highlights the importance of this seemingly trivial biological function. It also talks about how humans have lost the ability to breathe correctly and the grave consequences that it has on us. This really struck me. If I'm breathing wrong 20 some odd thousand times per day, what are the compounding effects? Breathing correctly can help improve our athletic performance, our general health, and even potentially our appearance. With different breathing techniques, we can also take control of some of our biological responses and biochemistry. I can honestly say that this book took my breath away. Or it gave me breath maybe, that's better. What? I'm not a news channel, but there's been an amazing breakthrough. Scientists have discovered a revolutionary new treatment that makes you live longer. It enhances your memory, it makes you more creative, it can even make you look more attractive. It keeps you slim and lowers your food cravings, it protects you from cancer and dementia, it wards off colds and the flu, it lowers your risk of heart attacks and stroke, not to mention diabetes. You'll even feel happier, less depressed, and less anxious. Are you interested? Honestly. How much would people pay for this drug? People would be investing billions of dollars in a product that would offer these results. The funny thing is, these are all the effects of getting regular high quality sleep. Book three on my list is called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And man, did this one do a number on me, a sleep number. I used to be that guy that would wake up every day at 4.30 and I'd get a workout in before I headed to the office. I'd also stay up late working on projects and, and and goofing off. I was apathetic to sleep because I figured I could catch up on the weekends or when I had less going on in my life. I could not have been more wrong. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was always tired. I wasn't getting the results I wanted in the gym. I wasn't getting the output that I wanted in my projects or in my work. Honestly, this all changed when I started viewing sleep differently. Even though I had less time in the day, I got significantly more done when I started getting more high quality sleep. In the book, Walker gives you a crash course on why sleep is important. Actually, it's more like an aggregation of horror stories about what goes on in your body when you don't get enough sleep. This did its job, it scared me straight. The book also gave me practical techniques for improving my quality of sleep. I changed my habits and my life completely changed as well. For starters, I removed my phone from my room at night. I turn off my electronics about one to two hours before bed. I track my sleep with my aura ring. I avoid light exposure at night. I skip caffeine after 2 p.m. And I've essentially stopped my consumption of alcohol because that is not good for your sleep. I also stopped using an alarm. Honestly, not everyone has the luxury to do, but the other ones are completely attainable by everyone. These changes have kickstarted the most healthy, motivated, and happy period of my life to date. One of the scariest things for many people is getting getting older. We don't think as clearly, we don't heal as fast, and we can't get around quite as well as we used to. But getting older is just a fact of life, right? What if it wasn't? In David Sinclair's book, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, he breaks down what goes on in our bodies as we age. What I'm saying is aging is caused because cells lose their packaging and then eventually cells lose their identity. He also goes into how many of the things that cause our aging 
might be preventable. Sinclair poses the question, why don't we look at aging like a disease? We spend so much money preventing specific diseases, but age is something we currently all face that is highly correlated or causal of most of the threatening diseases out there. There are huge spikes in diabetes, cancers, heart disease, etc. after we reach a certain age. What if we could lower someone's biological age instead of staving these specific diseases off? Sinclair also breaks down the things we can do now to reduce or to keep our biological age the same or to slow down our biological aging. There are both behavioral recommendations like exercise, eating better, fasting, and sleep, but Sinclair also highlights drug and supplement options that are being researched right now. Who knows, maybe you'll be stuck watching my videos for another 100 years. The number one book on my list ties all of these other books together beautifully. Without this, I wouldn't be able to take any action on the incredible insights that the previous six have instilled in me. The single book that had the greatest impact on me and my health and my life so far is called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I look at habits as synonymous with success. Habits allow us to make good decisions as frequently as possible with as little effort as possible. Most people won't deny the importance of good habits. What they struggle with is building these habits and sticking with them over time. This is where the book comes into play. Atomic Habits is about the science of establishing habits that will last. The key to this philosophy is in the name. An atom is essentially the smallest building block of our universe. When we create habits, we should be looking for the smallest building block that we can repeat every single day. Like if you just look at the numbers, if you were able to improve by 1% each day for an entire year, and those gains compound, you would end up 37 times better at the end of the year. Building a habit is about doing an activity repeatedly, no matter how small it is. The smaller we make the activity, the easier it is for us, and the more likely we are to repeat it. Once we start doing this activity without even thinking, we can build on it and begin to make real change in our life. Let's say I wanted to start exercising. Instead of committing to going to the gym for an hour every day, I would start by saying that I'm gonna do one push up each day. That's something that I could do almost every day, even if I was dead tired, if I was sick, or I had very, very limited time. This is the same premise behind my 66 days of data initiative. If you wanna learn data science, it starts with just five minutes a day. I've used this technique for my fitness, for my data science learning, for my content creation, for my work, for my reading, for my hygiene, for my sleep, for my diet, for my relationships. Literally every part of my life has been impacted by taking this incremental approach to habits. You start, for example, with one push-up, and then you say, okay, I'm, I can do one push-up every day, I'm gonna do two. And then you're down there and you're like, who just does two push-ups? I'm gonna do 20, right? It just makes perfect sense. The real beauty of this is that it's so simple to start. That's usually the hardest part. I hope that you can find the same value in these books as I did. It gets me so excited that there are so many books that I still haven't read that could impact me in the same way. I'm always looking for new book recommendations, so please let me know in the comment section below a few books that have changed your health or your life. I also wanna give credit to the Huberman Lab podcast. He talks a lot about many of these things and I've gotten a few of the books on this list based on Andrew Huberman's recommendation. As usual, thank you so much for watching and good luck on your learning journey.